ancient mariner, something, by the way, which is absolutely fascinating and important to do, uh, and uh, so on through the course. Now, I suppose it's my uh, reluctance um, to get into the intricacies of questions having to do with applied theory that makes me prefer to keep it simple. Our text is a story for toddlers called Tony the Tow Truck. I've decided not to pass it out today because, after all, I want to get it into the right hands. You can't read it unless you take the course. Uh, and, and so, you know, I'm going to wait a little bit. We don't, we don't come back to it, uh, at least for the moment. And, uh, but you see that it's mercifully short. Um, and as time passes, we will do uh, some rather interesting tricks with it. We will revert, as others revert to Lycidas, to Tony the Tow Truck for the purpose of introducing questions of applied theory. Now, this may suggest a certain condescension, both toward theory and toward <laughs> literary texts, uh, which is not at all intended. It's much more a question of reminding, that, uh, reminding you that if you can do it with this, you can do it with anything, uh, but also of reminding you that, after all, reading, reading just anything, um, is a complex and potentially almost unlimited activity. That's one of the good things uh, that theory teaches us and that I hope to be able to get across uh, in, our, in, the, in the course of our, of, of, of our varied approaches to Tony the tow truck. Now, theory resembles philosophy perhaps in this, that it asks fundamental questions and, and also at times builds systems. That is to say, theory has certain ambitions to a totalization of what can be thought uh, that resembles or rivals philosophy. But theory differs from philosophy, and this is something that I'm going to be coming back to uh, persistingly in the, se in the second half of this lecture and many times hereafter. Theory differs from most philosophy in that it involves a certain, and this is by no means self-evident, why should this be, is one of the questions we're going to be asking. It involves a certain skepticism. There seems to be a doubt, a, a variety of doubts, about the foundations of what we can think, about the basis of our opinions that pervades theory, uh, seems somehow or another to characterize its history. Now, not all theory that we read in this course is skeptical. Uh, some of the most powerful and profound thought that's been devoted to uh, the subject of theory of literature uh, is positive uh, in its intentions and in its views. But by and large, you will uh, happily or unhappily uh, come to terms with the fact that much of what you're going to be reading this semester is undergirded, or perhaps I should say undermined, uh, by this persisting skepticism. It's crucial, as I say, and I'm going to be come back, coming back to it, but it's just a point I want to make in passing about the nature of theory now. Turning to the word literature, this is not theory of rel relativity, theory of music, theory of government. This is, of course, in theory of literature, and theory of literature shares in common with other kinds of literature, uh, other kinds of theory, uh, the need for definition. That is to say, maybe the most central, and for, me, and for me possibly the most fascinating question theory asks is, well, what is literature? How do we know it when we see it? How can we define it? Now, much of what we'll be reading takes up the question, what is literature, and provides us with fascinating uh, and always for the moment, I think, enticing definitions. There are definitions based on form circularity, symmetry, economy of form, lack of economy of form, repetition. There are definitions based on psychological complexity, psychological balance, psychological harmony, sometimes psychological imbalance and disharmony. And there are also, there are also definitions which, which insist that somehow there's an epistemological difference between literature and other kinds of utterance. Whereas most utterances purport to be saying something true about the actual state of things in the world, uh, literary utterance is under no such obligation. The argument goes and ought properly to be understood as fiction, making it up 
as opposed to referring. All right, now all of these definitions have had currency. We'll be going over them again uh, and, I, and, and, and finding them, I hope, more fascinating uh, as we learn more about them. But at the same time, even as I rattle off this list of possibilities, probably you felt yourself an upsurge of skepticism. You said, my goodness, I can easily find exceptions to all those rules. It's ridiculous to think that literature could be defined in any one of those ways or even in a combination of all of them. Literature is many things, a many splendored thing, you say to yourself, and it simply cannot be confined or trapped within a definition of that kind. Well and good, properly ecumenical of you, but at the same time <laughs> it gives rise to a sense that possibly, after all, literature just isn't anything at all. In other words, that literature may not be susceptible of definition, of any one definition, but it is rather, and this is the so-called neo-pragmatist argument, but it is rather whatever you think it is. Or, more precisely, whatever your interpretive community says that it is. And this isn't really a big problem. It's kind of unsettling because we like to know what things are, but at the same time it's not really a big problem because as long as we know about the fact that, that a certain notion of literature exists in certain communities, we can begin to do very interesting work precisely with that idea. And we can say there's a great deal to learn about what people think literature is, and we can develop very interesting kinds of thinking uh, about the variety of ways in which these, uh, in which these ideas are, are expressed. And so it's not perhaps crippling if this is the conclusion we reach, but at the same time it's not the only possible conclusion. The possibility of definition persists. Uh, definition is important to us, and we're certainly not going to give it short shrift in this course. We're going to make every effort uh, to define literature uh, as carefully as we can. Now, in addition to defining literature, literary theory also asks questions, obviously not unrelated, but which open up the field somewhat. What causes literature, and what are the effects of literature? And in a way there's a subset of questions that arises from those to the effect, and this is of course what we'll be taking up next time, the question, what is an author? That is to say, if something causes literature, um, there must be some sort of authority behind it, uh, and therefore we find ourselves asking, what is an author? And by the same token, if literature has effects, it must have effects on someone, and this gives rise to the equally interesting and vexing question, what is a reader? And literary theory is very much involved with questions of that kind, uh, and organizing those questions is basically what rationalizes the structure of our syllabus. You'll notice that we move in the syllabus after a couple of introductory uh, talks that I'll, be, that I'll mention in a minute. We move in the syllabus from the idea that literature is in some sense caused by language to the idea that literature is in some sense caused by the human psyche to the idea that literature is in some sense caused by social, economic, and historical forces. And there are corollaries uh, for, the, for those ideas in terms of the kinds of effects that literature has and what we uh, might imagine ourselves to conclude from them. And finally, literary theory asks one other important question. It asks many, but this is the way at least I'm organizing it for today. It asks one other important question, the one with which we will actually begin. Not so much what is a reader, but how does reading get done? That is to say, how do we form the conclusion that we are interpreting something adequately, that we have a basis for the kind of reading that we're doing. What is the reading experience like? Uh, how do we meet the text face to face? How do we put ourselves in touch with the text, which may, after all, in a variety of ways, be remote from us? Now these are the questions that are asked by what's called hermeneutics, 
uh, a difficult word that we will be taking up next week. Um, it has to do with the god Hermes who conveyed language to man, in a certain sense among many other functions, the god of communication. Uh, and it is, after all, obviously uh, about communication. So hermeneutics will be our first topic, and, it's, and, and it attempts to answer uh, the last question that I'll mention, which is raised by theory of literature. All right, now let me pause quickly over the word introduction. I first started teaching this course in the late 70s and 80s when literary theory was a thing absolutely of the moment. Uh, as I told the teaching fellows, um, I had a colleague in those days who looked at me enviously and said he wished he had the black leather concession at the door. Theory was both hot and cool, and it was something about which, following from that, one had not just opinions but very, very strong opinions. In other words, the teaching fellows I had in those days, who knows, they may rise up against me in the same way this semester, but the teaching fellows I had in those days said, you can't teach an introduction. You can't teach a survey. You can't say, if it's Tuesday, it must be Foucault. If it's, if it's Thursday, it must be Lacan. You can't approach theory that way. Theory is important, and it's important to know what you believe. In other words, what the basis of all other possible theory is. I'm a feminist. I'm a Lacanian. I'm a student of Paul de Man. I believe that these are the foundational moments of theorizing, and that if you're going to teach anything like a survey, you've got to derive the rest of it from whatever the moment I happen to subscribe to <laughs> might be. Right? That's the way it felt to teach theory in those days. It was awkward teaching an introduction, and probably for that reason, <laughs> while I was teaching Lit 300, which was called Lit Y, Paul de Man was teaching Lit Z. He was, he was teaching a lecture course nearby uh, not at the same time, uh, which was interpretation as practiced by the school of Demand. That was Lit Z. And it did indeed apply, imply every other form of theory, uh, and it was extremely rigorous and interesting, but it wasn't a survey. It took for granted, in other words, that everything else would derive from the fundamental idea, but it didn't for a minute think that a whole series of fundamental ideas could share space, could be a kind of smorgasbord that you could mix and match in, in a kind of happy-go-lucky -go eclectic way, which perhaps we will be seeming to do from time to time in our introductory course. Well, now, do one, does one feel any nostalgia for the coolness and heat of this moment? Yes and no. Uh, it was fascinating to be. Uh, as Wordsworth says, bliss was it in that dawn to be alive. It was fascinating uh, to be around in those days. But at the same time, I think it's rather advantageous for us to be still in theory. That is to say, we still have views. We still have to recognize that what we think derives from this or that understanding of theory and these or those theoretical principles. And we have to understand the way in which what we do and say, what we write in our papers and articles, is grounded in theoretical premises which, if we don't come to terms with them, we will simply naively reproduce without being fully aware of how we're using them and how, indeed, they're using us. And so it is uh, as crucial as ever to understand theory. At the same time, we have the vantage point of, I suppose, what we can now call history. Some of what we'll be studying is no longer practiced as that which is the absolutely necessary central path to methodology. Some of what we're studying has had its moment of flourishing, has remained influential as a paradigm that shapes other paradigms, but is not itself perhaps today the paradigm, which gives us the opportunity of historical perspective so that from time to time during the course of the course I'll be trying to say something about why certain theoretical issues and ideas pushed themselves into prominence at certain historical moments. And that too then can become part of our enterprise. 
So an introduction is not only valuable for those of us who simply wish to acquire knowledge, it's also valuable, I think, in lending an additional perspective to the topic of theory and to an understanding about how theory is on the one hand, perhaps in a certain sense now, uh, an historical topic and is, on the other hand, something that we're very much engaged in and still committed to. So all that then by way of rationale for teaching an introduction to theory. All right now, the question, how does the history of uh, uh, how does literary theory relate to the history of criticism? Now this is a course that I like to teach too. Uh, usually teach it Plato to T. S. Eliot or Plato to I. A. Richards or some sort of important figure in the early 20th century. Uh, and it's a course uh, which is absolutely fascinating in all sorts of ways. And it has one very important thing in common with literary theory. That is to say, literary criticism is too perpetually concerned with the definition of literature. Many of the issues that I raised in talking about defining literature are as relevant for literary criticism as they are for literary theory. And yet we all instinctively know that these are two very different enterprises. Literary theory loses something that literary criticism just takes for granted. Literary theory is not concerned with issues of evaluation and it's not really concerned with concomitant issues of appreciation. Literary theory just takes those for granted as part of the, the sense experience, as one might say, uh, of any reader and prefers rather to dwell on questions of description, analysis, and speculation, as I've said. Now that's what's lost in theory. But what's new in theory? And here I come to the topic which will occupy most of my attention for the remainder of the lecture. What's new in theory is the element of skepticism that literary criticism, by and large, which is usually affirming a canon of some sort, uh, doesn't reflect. Literary theory, as I say, is skeptical about the foundations of its subject matter and also in many cases about the foundations of what it itself is doing. So the question is, how on earth did this come about? It's an historical question, as I say, and I want to devote the rest of the lecture to it. Why should doubt about the veridical or truth-affirming possibilities of interpretation be so widespread in the 20th century. Now, here a big glop of intellectual history. I think it arises from what one might call and what often is called modernity, not to be confused with modernism, an early 20th century phenomenon, but a, the history of modern thought as it usually derives from the generation of Descartes, Shakespeare, Cervantes. Notice something about all of those figures. Shakespeare uh, is preoccupied with figures who may or may not be crazy. Cervantes is preoccupied with a figure who is crazy. We're pretty sure of that, but he certainly is. It. He takes it for granted that he is the most rational and systematic of, of, of all thinkers and raises questions about, since we all take ourselves to be rational too, raises questions about just how we know ourselves not to be paranoid delusives like Don Quixote. And so that too can be unsettling when we think of this ha as happening at a certain contemporan contemporaneous moment uh, in the history of thought. Now Descartes, you remember in his meditations, begins by asking a, serious, a, a series of questions about how we can know anything. And one of the skeptical questions he asks is, well, might I not be crazy? In other words, Descartes is still thinking along these same lines. He says, well, maybe I've been seized by an evil genius of some kind, or maybe I'm just crazy. Now why, and here's the question, why do we get this nervousness about the relationship between what I know and how I know it arising at this moment? Well, I think it's characterized at least in part by what Descartes goes on to say in his meditations. 
Descartes settles the matter, uh, perhaps somewhat sweeping the question whether uh, uh, he's crazy under the rug, because I'm still not sure he answers that question, uh, but he settles the, ma the matter famously by saying, I think, therefore I am. And furthermore, as a concomitant, I think, therefore, all the things that I'm thinking about can be understood uh, to exist as well. Now, the Cartesian Revolution uh, establishes something that is absolutely crucial for what we call the Enlightenment of the next 100, 150 years. In other words, the idea that there is a distance between the mind and the things that it thinks about, but that this distance is a good thing. In other words, if you look too closely at a picture or if you stand too far away from it, you don't see it clearly, it's out of focus. But if you achieve just the right distance from it, it comes into focus. And the idea of scientific obje objectivity, the idea that motivates the creation of the great encyclopedia by the figures of the French Enlightenment, this idea all arises out of the idea that there is a certain appropriate objective distance between the perceiver and the perceived. Gradually, however, the idea that this distance is not too great begins to erode. So that in 1796, Kant, who isn't exactly enlisted on the side of the skeptics by most of his serious students, nevertheless does say something equally famous as that, that, as that which Descartes said and uh, a good deal more disturbing. We cannot know the thing in itself. Now, as I say, Kant erected such an incredibly magnificent scaffolding around the thing in itself, that is to say, the variety of ways in which, although we can't know it, we can sort of triangulate it and come to terms with it obliquely, that it seems churlish to enlist him on the side of the skeptics. But at the same time, there's a sense of a danger in the distance between subject and object that begins to emerge in thinking of this kind. Now, by 1807, Hegel in the Phenomenology of Mind is saying that in recent history and in recent developments of consciousness, something unfortunate has set in. We have unhappy consciousness. Unhappy consciousness which is the result of estrangement, entfremdo, which drives us too far away from the thing that we're looking at. We are no longer certain at all of what we're looking at, and consciousness therefore feels alienated. All right, so you can already begin to see a development in intellectual history that perhaps opens the way to a certain skepticism. But the crucial thing hasn't yet happened. Because after all, in all these accounts, even that of Hegel, there's no doubt about the authority of consciousness to think what it thinks. It may not clearly think about things, about objects, but it has a kind of legitimate basis that, that generates the sort of thinking that it does. But then, and here's where I want you to look at the passages that I've handed out, the, here's where uh, three great figures, there are others, but these are considered the seminal figures, begin to raise questions which complicate the whole issue of consciousness. Their argument is it's not just that consciousness doesn't clearly understand what it's looking at, it's also, and, and is therefore alienated from it, it's also that consciousness is alienated from its own underpinnings, that it doesn't have any clear sense of where it's coming from any more than what it's looking at. In other words, that consciousness is not only estranged from the world, but that it is in and of itself inauthentic. So just quickly to look at these passages. Marx is, uh, in the famous argument about commodity fetishism in Capital, is comparing the way in which we take the product of human labor and turn it into a commodity by saying that it has objective value by saying that we know what its value is in and of itself, he compares that with religion. The argument is, well, God is a product of human labor. In other words, it's not a completely supercilious argument. You know, I mean, sort of God is brought into being the same way objects that we make use of are brought into being. God is a product of human labor. But then we turn around and we say God exists and has value objectively. 
Marx's argument is that the two forms of belief, belief in the objective value of the commodity and belief in God, are the same. Now, whether or not any of this is true, believe me, is neither here nor there. The, the point that Marx is making, the point that Marx is making is that consciousness, that is to say, the way in which we believe things, is determined by factors outside its control. That is to say, in the case of Marx's arguments, social, historical, and economic factors that determine what we think and, and, and which in general we call ideology. That is to say, ideology is driven by factors beyond the ken of the person who thinks ideolo ideologically. So you see, the problem for consciousness now is not just a single problem, it's twofold. It's, it's inauthentic relationship with the things it looks at, and also it's inauthentic relationship with its own underpinnings. The argument is exactly the same for Nietzsche, only he shifts the ground of attack. For Nietzsche, the underpinnings of consciousness, which make the operations of consciousness in inauthentic, uh, are the nature of language itself. That is to say that when we think we're telling the truth, we're actually using worn out figures of speech. What then is truth? A mobile army of metaphors, metonymies, anthropomorphisms, in short, a sum of human relations which became poetically and rhetorically intensified, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and now no longer and, and are now no longer of account as coins, but are debased. Now that word now <laughs> is very important. It suggests that Nietzsche does somehow believe that there's a privileged moment in the history of language when perhaps language is a truth serum, when it is capable of telling the truth. But language has now simply be a, become a question of worn out figures, all of which dictates what we believe to be true. I speak uh, of, you know, I, 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 I speak. Uh, in a figurative way about the relationship between the earth and the sky, um, and I believe that there's a sky god. I, I speak because I simply don't believe that I'm using figures of speech. All of this is implied in Nietzsche's argument. In other words, language, the nature of language, the, the way language is received by us, in turn determines what we can do with it, which is to say, determines what we think. So that, there's, so that for Nietzsche, the distortion of truth, that is to say the distortion of the power to observe in consciousness, has as its underlying cause language, the state of language, the status of language. Freud finally argues for exactly the same relationship between consciousness, that is to say what I think I am thinking from minute to minute, and the unconscious which perpetually, in one way or another, unsettles what I'm thinking and saying from minute to minute. You know that in the psychopathology of everyday life, uh, Freud reminded us that the Freudian slip isn't something that happens just sometimes, and nobody knows, better than those, knows this better than a lecturer, <laughs> it's something that happens all the time. And, the, and, and the, Fre the Freudian slip is something that one lives with simply as a phenomenon of the slippage of consciousness under the influence of the unconscious. Now in the passage I gave you, Freud says a very interesting thing, which is that after all, we have absolutely no uh, objective evidence that the unconscious exists. You know, I mean, the unconscious, if I could see the unconscious, it would be conscious, right? The unconscious, what Freud is saying, is something that we have to infer from the way consciousness operates. We've got to infer something. We've got to figure out somehow how it is that consciousness is never completely inhibited, never completely does and says what it wants to say. So the spin on consciousness for Freud is the unconscious. Now, someone who didn't fully believe Marx, Nietzsche, and Freud, a very important modern philosopher in the hermeneutic tradition named Paul Ricoeur famously said in the fourth passage on your sheet that these great precursors of modern thought, and particularly I would immediately add of modern literary theory, 
together dominate a school of suspicion. There is, in other words, in Ricard's view, a hermeneutics of suspicion. And skepticism or suspicion is a word that can also be appropriated, perhaps more rigorously for philosophy, as negativity. That is to say, whatever seems manifest or obvious or patent in what we're looking at is undermined for this kind of mind by a negation which is counterintuitive, that is to say, which would seem uh, not, just, not just to qualify what we understand ourselves to be looking at, but to undermine it altogether. And these tendencies in the way in which Marx, Nietzsche, and Freud have been received, and when we read Foucault's What is an Author Next Time, we'll return to this question of how Marx, Nietzsche, and Freud have been received and what we should make of that in view of Foucault's idea that there's, well, you know, not that there's no such thing as an author, but that it's rather dangerous to believe that there are authors. Well, if it's dangerous to believe that there are authors, what about Marx, Nietzsche, and Freud? Foucault confronts uh, this question in What is an Author uh, and gives us some interesting results of his thinking. Uh, for us, the aftermath. Uh, particu- even per- precisely of the passages I've just quoted, but certainly of the oeuvre of the three uh, authors I've quoted from, uh, can it to a large degree be understood as accounting for the topic, the phenomenon of literary theory as we study it. In other words, literary theory, because of the influence of these figures, uh, is uh, to a considerable degree a hermeneutics of suspicion, recognized as such both by its uh, proponents and famously, I think uh, this is perhaps what is historical for you, uh, by its enemies. During the same period when I was first teaching this course, um, a veritable six-foot shelf of diatribes against literary theory was being written in the public sphere. There was the most, un- I mean, you can, you can take or leave literary theory, fine. But the idea that there would be such an incredible outcry against it was one of the most fascinating results of it. That is to say, for many, many, many people, literary theory had something to do with the end of civilization as we know it. That's one of the things that seems rather strange to us today from an historical perspective. But the found undermining of foundational knowledge, which seemed to be part and parcel of so much that went on in literary theory, was seen as the central, crucial threat to rationality emanating from the academy, and was attacked uh, in, those, in, in those terms in, as I say, at least six feet of lively polemics. Uh, all of that is the legacy of literary theory. And as I say, uh, it arises in part from this element of skepticism that I've thought it it best to emphasize today. Now, I think that (coughs) one thing Ricoeur leaves out and something that that, that we can anticipate as becoming more and more important for literary theory and other kinds of theory in the 20th century is Darwin. That is to say, it strikes me that Darwin could very easily be considered uh, a fourth hermeneut of suspicion. Of course, Darwin was not interested in suspicion, but he was certainly the founder of ways of thinking about consciousness that are determined, sociobiologically determined, determined in (coughs) in the realm of cognitive science, determined as artificial intelligence, and so on. All of this is Darwinian thinking and I think increasingly will be central in importance in the 21st century. What, what, <coughs> what will alter the, the shape of literary theory as it was known and studied in the 20th century is I think an increasing emphasis on cognitive science and sociobiological approaches both to literature and to interpretive processes uh, that uh, will derive from Darwin in the same way that strands of thinking of the 20th century derive from the three figures that I've mentioned. But 
What all this gives rise to, and this brings me finally to the passages which you have on both sides of your sheet and which I don't want to take up today, but just to preview. <coughs> the passages from James Ambassadors, 1903, and from Chekhov's The Cherry Orchard, 1904. In other words, I'm at pains to remind you that this is a specific historical moment in which, in a variety of ways, the speaker argues that consciousness, that is to say, the feeling of being alive and being someone acting in the world, no longer involves agency. The feeling that somehow to be conscious has become to be a puppet, that there is a, that, that there is a limitation on what we can do imposed by the idea that consciousness is determined in ways that we cannot control uh, and cannot get the better of. So that uh, Strether in The Ambassadors and Yepichodov in The Cherry Orchard speak for a point of view which is a kind of partially well-informed gloom and doom that could be understood to pervade uh, texts that are much better informed uh, that we will be considering but nevertheless are especially important as an aspect of their historical moment. And I want to begin the next lecture uh, by taking up those passages. Please do bring them. And I will also uh, uh, be, be, be passing around Tony the tow truck, uh, and I'll give you a brief description of what the little children's book actually looks like. Uh, and then we will plunge into the question, what is an author? So I'll see you on Thursday. Last time we introduced the way in which the preoccupation with literary and other forms of theory in the 20th century is shadowed by a certain skepticism. But as we were talking about that, we actually introduced another issue which isn't, which isn't quite the same as the issue of skepticism, namely determinism. In other words, we said that in intellectual history, first you get this movement uh, of concern about the distance between the perceiver and the perceived, uh, a concern that gives rise to skepticism about whether we can know things as they really are. Uh, but then, uh, as, a kind of, as a kind of aftermath of that movement, in figures like Marx, Nietzsche, and Freud, and you'll notice that Foucault reverts to such figures when he turns to the whole question of founders of discursivity. We'll come back to that. In figures like that, you, you, be, you get the further question, not just how we can know things in themselves as they really are, but how we can trust the autonomy of that which knows. In other words, how we can trust the autonomy of consciousness if, in fact, there's a chance, a good chance, according to these writers, that it is in turn governed by, controlled by, hidden powers or forces. And this question of determinism uh, is, as, is as important uh, in the discourse of literary theory uh, as the question of skepticism. They're plainly inter interrelated in a variety of ways, uh, but it's more that question to which uh, I want to return today. Now, last time, uh, following Ricoeur, uh, I mentioned Marx, Nietzsche, and Freud as key figures in this sort of secondary development that somehow inaugurates theory, uh, and then I added Darwin. And it seems particularly important to think of Darwin when we begin to think about the ways in which in the 20th century, a variety of thinkers are concerned about human agency. That is to say, what becomes of the idea that we have autonomy, that we can act, or at least that we can act with a sense of integrity uh, and not just uh, with a sense that we're uh, being pulled uh, by our strings like a puppet. Uh, the, in the aftermath of Darwin in particular, our understanding of natural selection, our understanding of genetic hardwiring and other factors makes us begin to wonder in what sense we can consider ourselves, each of us, to be autonomous subjects. And so, as I say, 
the question of agency arises, and it's in that context, needless to say, that I'd like to take a look at these two interesting pa passages on the sheet that has Chekhov on one side uh, and James on the other. Let's begin with the Chekhov. Uh, the Cherry Orchard, you know, is about the uh, threat uh, owing to socioeconomic conditions, the conditions that do ultimately lead to the Menshevik Revolution of 1907, to a landed estate uh, and the perturbation and turmoil uh, into which the cast of characters is thrown by this threat. Now, one of the more interesting characters, who's not really a protagonist in the play for class reasons, is a house servant named Yepikadov. And Yepikadov is a character who is, among other things, a kind of autodidact. That is to say, he has scrambled in uh, to a certain measure of knowledge about things. Uh, he is full of a kind of understandable self pity. And uh, his uh, speeches uh, are, in some ways, more characteristic of the gloomy intellectual milieu that is reflected in Chekhov's text really than almost anyone else's. And I wanted uh, to quote to you a couple of them. Uh, toward the bottom of the first page he says, I am a cultivated man. I read all kinds of remarkable books, and yet I can never make out what direction I should take, what it is that I want properly speaking. And as I read, pay attention to the degree to which he, he's constantly talking about language and about the way in which he himself is inserted into language. He's perpetually seeking a mode of properly speaking. Uh, he is a person who is uh, 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 somewhat knowledgeable about books, feels himself somehow to be caught up in the matrix of book learning. Uh, in other words, a person who is very much preoccupied with his conditioning by language, uh, not least when, perhaps unwittingly, he alludes to Hamlet. Should I live or should I shoot myself, properly speaking, to be or not to be? In other words, he inserts himself into the dramatic tradition to which, as a character, he himself belongs uh, and shows himself to be uh, in a debased form derived from one of those famous charismatic moments uh, in which a hero utters a comparable concern. Uh, and so in all sorts of ways, in this simple passage, we find a character who's caught up in the snare, if I can put it that way, caught up in the snare of language. Uh, to continue, uh, in the, uh, he says, uh, properly speaking, top of the next page, properly speaking and letting other subjects alone, I must say everything in terms of what other discourse does and what he himself can say, I must say, and of course it's mainly about me, regarding myself, among other things, that fate treats me mercilessly as a storm treats a small boat. The end of the passage is, have you read Buckle? Now, Buckle is a forgotten name today, but at one time he was just about as famous as Os Oswald Spengler, who wrote The Decline of the West. He was a Victorian historian preoccupied with the dissolution of Western civilization. In other words, Buckle was the avatar of the notion in the late 19th century that everything was going to hell in a handbasket. Uh, the one of the texts that Yepikadov has read that in a certain sense determines him uh, is Buckle. Have you read Buckle? I wish to have a word with you, Avdotya Fyodorovna. In other words, uh, I'm arguing that the saturation of these speeches with signs of words, language, speaking, words, books, is just the dilemma of the character. That is to say, he is in a certain sense book and language determined, and he's obscurely aware that this is his problem even as it's a source of pride for him. Turning then to a passage in a very different tone from James's ambassadors, an altogether charming character, the elderly Lambert Strether, who has gone to, most of you know, has gone to Paris to bring home 
the young Chad Newsom, a relative who's to take over the family business, uh, the manufacturer of an unnamed household article in Woollett, Massachusetts, probably toilet paper. In any case, Lambert Strether, as he arrives in Paris, uh, has awakened to the sheer wonder of urbane culture, and, he's re and he recognizes that he's missed something. And he's gone to a, to a party given by a sculptor, and at this party he meets a young man named Little Billum, whom he likes, and he takes Little Billum aside by the lapel uh, and he makes a long speech to him, uh, in effect saying, don't do what I have done. Don't miss out on life. Live all you can. It is a mistake not to. And this is why, he goes on to say, the affair I mean the affair of life, it's as though he's anticipating the affair of Chad Newsom and Madame de Vianney, which is revealed at the end of the text. The, the, the affair, I mean the affair of life, couldn't no doubt have been different for me. For it's, it meaning life, life is, at the best, a tin mold, either fluted or embossed, with ornamental excrescences or else smooth and dreadfully plain into which a helpless jelly, one's consciousness, is poured, so that one takes the form, as the great cook says. Great cook, by the way, is Bria Savarin. One takes the form, as the great cook says, and is more or less compactly held by it. One lives in fine as one can. Still, one has the illusion of freedom. And here's where Strether says something very clever that I think we can make use of. He says, therefore, don't be like me without the memory of that illusion. I was either at the right time too stupid or too intelligent to have it. I don't quite know which. Now, if he was too stupid to have it, then, of course, he would have been liberated into the realm of action. He would have been what Nietzsche, in an interesting precursor text, calls historical man. He simply would have plunged ahead into life as though he had freedom, even though he was too stupid that it was to, that he, to recognize that it was an illusion. On the other hand, if he was too intelligent to, as it were, bury the illusion and live as though he were free. If he was too intelligent to do that, he's a kind of an avatar of the literary theorist. In other words, the sort of person who can't forget long enough that freedom is an, in, in, is an illusion in order to get away from the preoccupations that, as I've been saying, uh, characterize a certain kind of thinking in the 20th century. And it's rather charming at the last that he says, because how can we know anything? I don't quite know which. And so that too strikes me as a helpful and also characteristic passage that can introduce us to today's subject, which is the loss of authority. That is to say, in Roland Barthes' terms, the death of the author, in Foucault's terms, the question, what is an author. In other words, the first sacrifice in the absence of human agency, the first sacrifice for literary theory is the author, the idea of the author, and that's what will concern us in this second still introductory lecture to this course. We'll get into the proper uh, or, or at least more systematic business of the course uh, uh, when we turn to hermeneutics next week. Now, let me, let me set the scene. This is Paris. wouldn't have to be Paris. It could be Berkeley or Columbia or maybe Berlin. It's 68, 69, spilling over into the 70s. Students and most of their professors are on the barricades, that is to say, in, the in, 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 in protest not only against the war in Vietnam but the outpouring of various forms of authoritative resistance to protest that characterized the 60s. There is a ferment of intellectual revolt which takes all sorts of forms in Paris. 
but is first and foremost perhaps organized by what quickly in this country became a bumper sticker, question authority. This is the framework in which the then most prominent intellectual in France writes an essay at the very peak of the student uprising, what is an author? and poses an answer which is by no means straightforward and simple. You're probably a little frustrated because maybe you sort of anticipated what he was going to say, and then you read it and you said, gee, he really isn't saying that. In fact, I don't quite know what he is saying, uh, and, and, and struggled more than you expected to uh, because you anticipated what I've just been saying about the setting and about the role of Foucault and all the rest of it, and were possibly more confused than you might have expected to be, and yet at the same time you probably felt, oh yeah, well I did come out pretty much in the place I expected to come out in, despite the roundabout way of having gotten there. Because this lecture is introductory, I'm not going to spend a great deal of time explicating the more difficult moments uh, in his argument. Uh, I am going to emphasize what you perhaps did anticipate that he would say, uh, and so that can take us along rather smoothly. There is an initial issue, and because we're as skeptical about skepticism as we are about anything else, we're likely to raise our eyebrows and say, hmm, doesn't this guy Foucault think he's an author? You know, I mean, after all, he's a superstar. Uh, he's, uh, you know, he, he's, he, he's used to being taken very seriously. Does he want to say that he's just an author function? That his textual field is a kind of set of structural operations within which one can discover an author? Does he really want to say this? Well, this is the question raised by the skeptic about skepticism or about theory, and it's one that we're going to take rather seriously. But we're going to come back to it because there are ways, it seems to me, of keeping this question at arm's length. In other words, Foucault is up to something interesting, and probably we should meet him at least halfway to see, to measure the degree of interest. And so, yes, there is the question, there is the, there is the fact that stands before us that this very authoritative sounding person seems to be an author, right? I mean, I never, never met anybody who seemed more like an author than, than, than this person. Uh, and yet he's raising the question whether there is any such thing, or in any case the question how difficult it is to decide what it is uh, if there is. And so let me digress with an anecdote which may or may not sort of help us to understand the delicacy of this relationship between a star author, a person undeniably a star author, and the atmosphere of thought in which there is, in a certain sense, no such thing as an author. An old crony and former colleague of mine uh, was taking a course at Johns Hopkins in the 1960s. This was a time when Hopkins led all American universities in the importing of important European scholars, uh, and it was a place of remarkable intellectual ferment. And this particular lecture course was being given by Georges Poulet. Uh, a, a so-called phenomenological critic. It's one, of the, it's one of the isms we aren't covering in this seminar, but in any case, Foulet, Poulet was also a central figure on the scene of the 60s. And Poulet would be lecturing along, and there, the students had somehow formed a habit of, from time to time, by the way, you can form this habit too, of raising their hand, and what they would do is they would utter a name. At least this is what my friend noticed. They would raise their hand and they would say, Malarmé. And Poulet would look at them and say, Mais oui, exactement. A mon avis. It's yeah, yeah. And then he would go on. <laughs> and he, would, he would go on and, and continue to lecture for a while. And somebody else would raise his hand and say, Proust. Ah, précisément. Précisément. <laughs> Proust, Proust. And then, you know, he'd continue along. So my friend decided he'd, he'd give it a try. <laughs> And he raised his hand and he said, Voltaire! And Poulet said, Quoi donc? <laughs> je, vous, je, je, je vous comprends pas! You know, and then paused and hesitated and continued with his lecture as though my friend had never asked his question. Now, this is a, this is a ritual 
of introducing names. But and, and in a certain sense, yes, the names of authors, the names of stars. But at the same time, plainly, names that stand for something other than their mere name. Names that stand for domains or fields of interesting discursivity. That is to say, I mean, Pouquet, Poulet was the kind of critic who, who believed that, it, that the oeuvre of an author was a totality that could be understood as a structural whole, and his criticism worked that way. And so, yes, the, the signal that this field of discursivity is on the table is introduced by the name of the author, but it remains just a name. It's an author without authority, simply yet at the same time, it's an author who stands for, whose name stands for, an important field of discourse. And that's, of course, what my friend, because he knew perfectly well that when he said Voltaire, Poulet would would <laughs> have nothing to do with it. Uh, that, that's, that's, the, that's the idea that my friend wanted to experiment with. There are relevant and interesting fields of discourse, and there are completely irrelevant fields of discourse, and uh, some of these fields are on the sides of angelic discourse, and some of these fields are on the side of the demonic, uh, and, so, and, and, and we simply kind of spontaneously make the division. Discursivity, discourse, that's what I forgot to talk about last time. When I said that, sometimes people just ultimately throw up their hands when they try to define literature uh, and say, well, literature is just whatever you say it is, um, fine, let's just go ahead, uh, are much more likely, rather than using the word literature, to use the word discourse or textual field. Uh, discursivity. You begin to hear the slight, or, f or perhaps smell, the slight whiff of jargon uh, that pervades theoretical writing. It always does so for a reason. Uh, this is the reason one hears so much about discourse, simply because the of doubt about the generic integrity of various forms of discourse. One can speak hesitantly of literary discourse, political discourse, uh, anthropological discourse, but one doesn't want to go so far as to say literature, political science, anthropology. And so it's, it, it, it's a habit that arises from this sense of the permeability of all forms of utterance with respect to each other. Uh, and that habit, uh, as I say, is a kind of is, is a breakdown of the notion that certain forms of utterance can be understood as a delimited, structured field. And one of the reasons this understanding seems so problematic is the idea that we don't appeal to the authority of an author in making our mind about the nature of a given field of discourse. We find the authority of the author instead somewhere within the textual experience. The author is a signal, is what Foucault calls a function. The author certainly appears. By the way, th this isn't at all a question of the author not existing. Yes, Bach talks about the death of the author, but he doesn't. Uh, and, but even Bach doesn't mean that the author is dead like Nietzsche's God. Um, the author is there, sure. It's a question rather of how we know the author to be there. As firstly, and secondly, whether or not in attempting to determine the meaning of, the a te uh, of a text, and this is something we'll be talking about next week, we should appeal to the authority of an author. If the author is a function, that function is something that appears, perhaps problematically appears, within the experience of the text, something we get in terms of the speaker the narrator, or in the case of plays, the orchestrator of the text, something that we infer from the way the text unfolds. So as a function and not as a subjective consciousness to which we appeal to grasp a meaning, the author still does exist. So we consider a text as a structured entity or perhaps as an entity which is structured and yet at the same time somehow or another passes out of structure, 
Uh, that's the case with Roland Barthes. And in so doing, and here I want to appeal to a couple of passages. I want to, be, I want to, I want to quote from the beginning of Roland Barthes' essay, which I know I only suggested, but I'm simply going to quote the passage so you don't have to have read it, uh, The Death of the Author. It's on page 874, for those of you who have your text, as I hope you do. Barthes bege- Barthes is r- while writing this, he's writing pr- what has perhaps in retrospect seemed to be his most important book. It's called S.Z. It's a huge book which is all about this short story by Balzac, Saracine, uh, that he begins this essay by quoting. And this is what he says about Saracine. In, s- in his story Saracine, Balzac, describing a castrato disguised as a woman, writes the following sentence. This was woman herself, with her sudden fears, her irrational whims, her instinctive worries, her imperious boldness, her fussings, and her delicious sensibility." End quote. Bach says, who is speaking thus? Is it the hero of the story, bent on remaining ignorant of the castrato hidden beneath the woman? Is it Balzac the individual? furnished by his personal experience with a philosophy of woman? Is it Balzac, the author, professing literary ideas on femininity? Is it universal wisdom, romantic psychology? We shall never know, for the good reason that writing is the destruction of every voice, of every point of origin. Writing is that neutral, composite, oblique space where our subject, and this is a deliberate pun, our subject slips away. Our subject meaning that we don't quite know what's being talked about sometime, but also, and more importantly, the subject, the authorial subject, the actual identity of the given speaking subject. That's what slips away. The negative where all identity is lost, starting with the very identity of the body writing." So that's a shot fired across the bow against the author uh, because it's Bach's supposition that we really it's th- that the author isn't maybe quite a, an author function because that, uh, that function may be hard to identify in a discrete way among uh, myriad other functions. Foucault, who I think does take for granted that a textual field is more firmly structured than Bach supposes, Foucault says on page 913, when we speak of the author function as opposed to the author, and here I begin quoting uh, at the bottom of the left-hand column on page 913, when we speak in this way, we no longer raise the questions How can a free subject penetrate the substance of things and give it meaning? How can it activate the rules of a language from within and thus give rise to the designs which are properly its own? In other words, we no longer say, how does the author exert autonomous will with respect to the subject matter being expressed? We no longer appeal in other words, to the authority of the author as the source of the meaning that we find in the text. Foucault continues, instead these questions will be raised. How, under what conditions, and in what forms can something like a subject appear in the order of discourse? What place can it occupy in each type of discourse? What functions can it assume? and by obeying what rules. In short, it is a matter of depriving the subject, that is to say when we speak in this way of an author function, it is a matter of depriving the subject or its substitute, a character for example, or a speaker as we say when we don't mean that it's the poet talking but uh, the guy speaking in My Last Duchess or whatever, right? Its role so we, b- of depriving the subject or its substitute of its role as originator and of analyzing the subject as a variable and complex function of discourse. The subject here always means the subjectivity 
of the speaker, right? not, not the subject matter. That's if you'll, you'll, get, you'll get used to it because it's a word that does a lot of duty uh, and you need to develop context in which you recognize, well, yeah, I'm talking about the human subject or, well, I'm talking about the subject matter. Uh, but uh, I trust that you will quickly kind of uh, uh, adjust to, to, to that difficulty. All right, so with this said, probably it's time to say something in defense of the author. I mean, I know that you wish you could stand up here and say something in defense of the author, so I will speak in behalf of all of you who want to defend the author by quoting a wonderful passage from Samuel Johnson's preface to Shakespeare, in which he explains for us why it is that we have always paid homage to the authority of the author. It's not just a question, as obviously Foucault and Barthes are always suggesting, of deferring to authority as though the authority were the police with a baton in its hand. Right? It's not a question of deferring to authority in that sense. It's, it's, it's a question, rather, of affirming what we call the human spirit. And this is what Johnson says. There is always a silent reference of human works to human abilities. And as the inquiry, how far man may extend his designs or how high he may rate his native force, is of far greater dignity than in what rank we shall place any particular performance, curiosity is always busy to discover the instruments as well as to survey the workmanship, to know how much is to be ascribed to original powers and how much to casual and adventitious help. So what Johnson is saying is, well, it's all very well to consider a textual field, the workmanship, but at the same time we want to remind ourselves of our worth. We want to say, well, gee, it's not just sort of, it, that wasn't produced by a machine. That was, that's not just a set of functions, variables as one might say in the lab. It's produced by Genius! It's, it, it's, it's something that allows us to rate human ability high, and that, especially in this veil of tears, and Johnson is very conscious of this being a veil of tears, that's what we want to keep doing. We want to rate human potential as high as we can, and it is for that reason, in a completely different spirit, in the spirit of homage rather than cringing fear, that we appeal to the authority of an author. Well, all right, that's an argument for the other side. But these are different times. This is 69. And the reason, the purpose that's alleged for appealing to the author as a paternal source, as an authority, is, according to both Bach and Foucault, to police the way texts are read. In other words, both of them insist that the appeal to the author, as opposed to the submersion of the author in the functionality of the textual field, that the appeal to the author is a kind of delimitation or policing of the possibilities of meaning. Let me just read two texts to that effect. First, going back to Roland Barthes uh, on page 877. Bach says, once the author is removed, the claim to decipher a text becomes quite futile. By the way, once again, there's a bit of a rift there between Bach and Foucault. Foucault wouldn't say quite futile. He'd say, oh no, we can decipher it, but the author function is just one aspect of the deciphering process. But Bach has entered a phase of his career in which he actually thinks that structures are so complex that they cease to be structures, and that we and and and, and that uh, uh, this has a great deal to do with the influence of deconstruction, and we'll come back to that much later in the course. But in any case, he continues: to give a text an author is to impose a limit on that text, to furnish it with a final signified, to close the writing. Such a conception suits criticism. And criticism is a lot like policing, right? Criticism means being a critic, you know, criticizing. Such a, such a solution suits criticism very well. 
the latter, then allotting itself the important task of discovering the author or its hypostases, society, history, psyche, liberty, beneath the work. When the author has been found, the text is explained, a victory to the critic. In other words, the policing of meaning has been accomplished and the critic wins, just as in the uprisings of the late 60s, the cops win. And this is, you know, again, the atmosphere uh, in which all of this, all of this occurs. Uh, just then to reinforce this uh, with, the, uh, with, with, with the pronouncement of Foucault at the bottom of page 913, right-hand column. The author is the ideological figure by which one marks the manner in which we fear the proliferation of meaning. Now this may, uh, once again, I mean, you sort of the, the skepticism about skepticism in you says, why should I fear the proliferation of meaning? I want to know what something definitely means. I don't want to know that it means a million things. You know, I'm here to learn what things mean in so many words. Uh, I don't want to be told that I could sit here for the rest of my life just sort of parsing one sentence. You know, don't tell me about that. Don't tell me about these, these complicated sentences from Balzac's short story. I'm here to know what things mean. I don't care if it's policing or not. Uh, whatever it is, let's get it done. And that, of, that of course, is approaching the question of how we might uh, delimit meaning in a very different spirit. The reason uh, I acknowledge the, the, the legitimacy of responding in this way is that to a certain extent the preoccupation with what shall we say, the misuse of the appeal to an author is very much of its historical moment. That is to say, when uh, one can scarcely say the word author without thinking authority, and one can definitely never say the word authority without thinking about the police. This is a, you know, this, this, this is a, a structure of thought um, that perhaps pervades the lives of many of us to this day, has always the per pervaded the lives of many people, but is not quite as hegemonic in our thinking uh, today, perhaps, uh, as it was in the moment of these essays by Barthes uh, and, and Foucault. All right. With all this said, how can the theorist recuperate honor for certain names, like, for example, his own? You know, all right, it's all very well. You're not an author, but I secretly think I'm an author. Right? How, 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 let's, let's suppose someone were dastardly enough uh, to harbor such thoughts. Uh, how could you develop an argument? How could you develop an argument in which a thought like that might actually seem to work? After all, Foucault, setting himself aside, he doesn't mention himself, Foucault very much admires certain writers. In particular, he admires, like so many of his generation and other generations, Marx and Freud. It's a problem. It's a problem if we reject the police-like authority of authors of whom we may have a certain suspicion on those grounds. Well, we certainly don't feel that way about Marx and Freud. What's the difference then? How is Foucault going to, mar to mount an argument uh, in which privileged authors, that is to say figures whom one cites positively and without a sense of being policed, can somehow or another stay in the picture? Foucault, by the way, doesn't mention Nietzsche, but he might very well because Nietzsche's idea of genealogy is perhaps the central influence on Foucault's work. Uh, I think it's, frankly, I think it's just an accident that he doesn't mention him. Would have been a perfect symmetry because last time we quoted uh, Paul Ricoeur to the effect that these authors, Marx, Nietzsche, and Freud, were, and this is Ricoeur's word, masters. Whoa! That's the last thing we want to hear. You know, that they're not masters. Foucault couldn't possibly allow for that because plainly the whole, the whole texture of the discourse would be undermined by introducing the notion that it's okay to be a master. And yet Ricoeur feels that these figures dominate modern thought as masters. How does Foucault deal with this? He invents a concept. <laughs> he says, they aren't authors. 
They're founders of discursivity. Founders of discursivity. And then he says, it's kind of, he grants that it's kind of difficult to distinguish between a founder of discursivity and an author who has had an important influence. Right? And then he talks about the Gothic novel. And he talks about Radcliffe's and Radcliffe's. Go- he's wrong about this, by the way. The founder of discursivity in Gothic novel is not Anne Radcliffe. It's Horace Walpole. That's okay. Um, he talks. He, he talks about Anne Radcliffe uh, as the person who establishes certain tropes and topoi and premises uh, that govern the writing of Gothic fiction for the next hundred years and indeed even into the present. So that she is, Foucault acknowledges, in a certain sense, a person who establishes a way of talking, a way of writing, a way of narrating. But at the same time, she she isn't a person, Foucault claims, uh, who who introduces a discourse or sphere of debate within which ideas, without being attributable necessarily, can nevertheless be developed. Well, I don't know. It seems to me that literary influence is not at all unlike uh, sort of speaking or writing in the wake of a founder of discursivity, but we can let that pass. And on the other hand, Foucault is very concerned to distinguish figures like this from scientists like Galileo and Newton. Now, it is interesting, by the way, maybe in defense of Foucault, that whereas we speak of people as Marxist or Freudian, we don't speak of people as Radcliffian or Galilean or Newtonian. I mean, we use the adjective Newtonian, but we don't speak of certain writers who are still interested in quantum mechanics as Newtonian writers. Uh, and that's interesting in a way, uh, and, and, and may somehow or another justify Foucault's understanding that the texts of those author functions known as Marx and Freud, whose names might be raised in Poulet's lecture class uh, with an enthusiastic response as placeholders for those fields of discourse. It may, it may in some sense, reinforce Foucault's argument that these are special inaugurations of debate, of developing thought that do not necessarily kowtow to the originary figure. Certainly debatable. I mean, we don't, we don't want to pause over it uh, in the case either of Marx or of Freud. Plainly, there are a great many people who think of them as tyrants, right? But, it is, but, but within the traditions that they established, it is very possible to understand them as instigating ways of thinking without necessarily provi- presiding over those ways of thinking authoritatively. And that is the special category that Foucault wants to reserve for those privileged figures whom he calls founders of discursivity. All right, very quickly then to conclude. One consequence of the author, the death of the author, the disappearance of the author into author function, is, as Foucault curiously says in passing on uh, page 907, that the author has no legal status. And you say, what? What about copyright? What about intellectual property? That's a horrible thing to say, that the author has no legal status. Notice once again the intellectual context. It is a copyright arose as a bourgeois idea. That is to say, I possess my writing. I have an ownership relationship with my writing. The disappearance of the author, like the disappearance of a, a, a kind of corollary, di- corollary disappearance of bourgeois thought, um, entails, in fact, a kind of bracketing of the idea of copyright or intellectual property. And so there's a certain consistency in what Foucault is saying about the author having no legal status. But maybe at this point it really is time to dig in our heels. I am a lesbian Latina. I stand before you as an author articulating an identity for the purpose of achieving freedom, not to police you, not to deny your freedom, but to find my own freedom. And I stand before you precisely 
and in pride as an author. I don't want to be called an author function. I don't want to be called an instrument of something larger than myself because, frankly, that's what I've always been. And I want, precisely as an authority, through my authorship, to remind you that I am not anybody's instrument, but that I am autonomous and free. In other words, the author, the idea, the traditional idea of the author, so much under suspicion in the work of Foucault and Barthes in the late 60s, the traditional idea of the author can be turned on its ear. It can be understood as a source of newfound authority, of the freedom of one who has been characteristically not free and can be received by a reading community in those terms. It's very difficult to think how a Foucault might respond to that insistence. And it's a problem that, in a way, dogs everything, many of the things we're going to be reading uh, during the course of the semester. Even within the sorts of theorizing that are characteristically called cultural studies and concern questions of, I of the politics of identity, even within those disciplines, there is a division of thought between people who affirm the autonomous integrity and individuality of the identity in question, and those who say any and all identities are only subject positions discernible and revealed through the matrix of social practices. There is this intrinsic split even within those forms of theory, and not to mention the kinds of theory that don't directly have to do with the politics of identity, between those it for whom what's at stake is the discovery of autonomous individuality and those for whom what's at stake is the tendency to hold at arm's length such discoveries uh, over against the idea that the instability of any and all subject positions is what actually contains within it as Foucault and Barthes thought, as they sort of sat looking at the police, standing over against them, that's it, that, that this alternative notion of the undermining of any sense of that which is authoritative uh, is, in its turn, a possible source, finally, of freedom. And these sorts of vexing issues, as I say, in all sorts of ways will dog much of what we read during the course of the semester. All right, so much for the introductory lectures, uh, which touch on aspects of the materials that we'll keep returning to. On Tuesday, we'll turn to a more specific subject matter, hermeneutics, what hermeneutics is, how we can think about the nature of interpretation, and our primary text will be the excerpt in your book from Hans-Georg Gadamer and a few passages that I'll be handing out from Martin Heidegger and E.D. Hirsch. All right, uh, <clears throat> let's uh, hope we can uh, free our minds of these matters now and turn to something a little more substantive, uh, which is uh, the question uh, before we plunge into Gadamer, really perhaps the question, what is hermeneutics? Uh, well, it's easily enough explained what it is, despite the sort of difficulty and thorniness of the word, uh, uh, it is uh, the art uh, or, or uh, principles of interpretation. Um, but hermeneutics has a history. That is to say, it's not something which has always been just there. It's not something that people have always thought about in a systematic way. Strictly speaking, what I've just said isn't true. Uh, many of you probably know that Aristotle has a treatise called De Interpretatione. Um, the Middle Ages are rife with, uh, with uh, treatises on interpretation. Uh, and suppose what I suppose what I'm really saying is that the word hermeneutics wasn't available, and the idea that there ought to be a sort of a systematic study of how we interpret things um, wasn't really uh, current. Um, but uh, so, and, and of course, by the same token, um, uh, uh, the, the notion of hermeneutics arises primarily 
uh, in religion first, uh, in, and, and specifically in the Christian tradition, but that isn't to say that there hasn't been, that there wasn't long before the moment at which hermeneutics became important in Christianity. Uh, that's not to say that there wasn't uh, uh, centuries worth of Talmudic scholarship, uh, which is essentially also hermeneutic in nature, that is to say, concerned with the art and basis of interpretation. But what gave rise to, in, in the Western world, to what is called hermeneutics was, in fact, uh, the Protestant Reformation. And there's a lot of significance of that, uh, in, in that, I think, and, and I'll try to explain why. You don't really puzzle your head about questions of interpretation, how we interpret validity of interpretation, and so on, until it, A, meaning becomes terribly important to you, and B, the ascertainment of meaning becomes difficult. And you say to yourself, well, isn't it always the case that meaning is important and that meaning is hard to construe? Well, not necessarily. You know, if uh, you are a person whose sacred scripture is adjudicated by the pope and the occasional tribunal of church elders, you yourself don't really need to worry very much about what scripture means. You're told what it means. It goes without saying, therefore, what it means. But in the wake of the Protestant Reformation, when the question of one's relationship with the Bible became personal and everyone was, un was understood, if only through the local minister, to be uh, engaged with coming to an understanding of what is, after all, pretty difficult. Who on earth knows what the parables mean and so on, and the, and, and the whole of the Bible uh, poses interpretive difficulties. Then, of course, you're going to have to start worrying about how to interpret it. And needless to say, since it's a sacred scripture, the meaning of it is important to you. You do want to know what it means. It can't mean just anything. It's crucial to you to know exactly what it means and why what it means is important. And so as Protestantism took hold, by the same token, the, art and the arts and sciences of hermeneutics took hold and people began to write treatises about interpretation. But it was always interpretation of the Bible. In other words, in this tradition, religion came first. After that, the next thing that happens is you begin to get the rise of constitutional democracies. And as you get that, you begin to be become much more interested as a citizen uh, or as a person who has suffrage or as a person in one way or another um, has, the, uh, has, ha has the rights uh, of the state or nation, you, be you begin to become concerned about the nature of the laws you live under. And that's why hermeneutics gradually moved, not deserting religion, but so I should say expanded, to the study of the law. And the arts and sciences that had been developed in thinking about uh, interpreting scripture were then applied to the interpretation of something the meaning of which had become almost as important. That is to say, it mattered what the law was and how it was to be interpreted. And you know, of course, that this is absolutely crucial to the study of the law to this day. You know, what are the grounds uh, for understanding the meaning of the Constitution, for example? Uh, there are widespread controversies about it, and, and many of the courses you would take in law school are meant to try to get to the bottom of these thorny questions. Well, uh, well and good. Once again, you see that hermeneutics enters a field when the meaning of something becomes more important and when uh, that meaning is recognized to be difficult to grasp. Now, as yet, you know, we haven't said anything about literature. And the fact is, there is no art of, uh, no hermeneutic art devoted to literature during the early modern uh, period and for most of the 18th century. Uh, think about, you know, the writers you've studied from the 18th century. It's very interesting that they all just sort of take meaning for granted. Uh, you th if, if, if you think about Pope, for example, or even Johnson, 
as they reflect on literature and why it's important and what the nature of literature is, they, don't, they aren't concerned about interpretation. They're concerned about evaluation, establishing the principles of, 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 what, of, of, of what's at stake um, in writing a poem or in writing some literature in some other form. Uh, uh, and, and, and raise questions that are largely uh, moral uh, and, and aesthetic. They're not concerned about interpretation because to them good writing is precisely writing that's clear, writing that doesn't need to be interpreted but has as precisely as its virtue its transparency of meaning. And in fact, during this whole period, um, playwrights were writing prologues to their plays, abusing for each other for being obscure. That is to say, abusing each other for requiring interpretation. In other words, I don't understand what your metaphors are all about. You don't know what a metaphor is. All you do is make one, is, 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 is make one verbal mistake after another. Nobody can understand you. This is the nature of the prose uh, and verse prefaces to uh, theatrical pieces in the 18th century. And, and, and from that you can see that interpretation is not only not studied, but is considered to be completely extraneous to what's valuable about literature. If you have to interpret it, it isn't any good. But then, as the 18th century wears on, you begin to get the sense, in the first place, you get, uh, as, as, as uh, with the emergence of Romanticism, you get a kind of, as, as is well known and I think often overstated, uh, you get a cult of genius. Uh, you get the idea uh, that everything arises uh, from the extraordinary uh, mental acuity or spiritual insight of an author and that ne what needs to be understood about literature is the genius of its production. Well, well and good, but at the same time, if that's the case and if there's this extraordinary emphasis on the importance of the expression of genius, you can see what's beginning to happen. The literary creator starts to seem a lot more like the divine creator, that is to say, uh, and, and in a certain sense could be understood as a placeholder for the divine creator. Remember that uh, secularization uh, uh, in Western culture uh, is increasing during the course of the Enlightenment, that is to say during the course of the 18th century, and there's a certain way in which Romanticism and in what, what's important about Romanticism can be understood as what Northrop Frye has called a secular scripture. In other words, the meaning of literature becomes more difficult because it's profoundly subjective and no longer uh, some and, and, and no longer engaged with shared values. Uh, and the importance of literature, that is to say, our sense of why it's so important to understand it, has also grown because for many people it begins to take over, partly at least, the role of religion. And so with the rise of secular scripture, that is to say literature imagined as something both terribly important and also difficult to understand, naturally the arts and sciences of hermeneutic, hermeneutics begin to enter that field. And in particular, the great theologian of the Romantic period, Friedrich Schleiermacher, uh, devoted his career to uh, principles of hermeneutics that were meant to be applied as much to literature as to the study of Scripture uh, and established a tradition in which it was understood that literature was a central focus of hermeneutics. So that's then for the history of, of hermeneutics. The, uh, the work of, of, of Diltai around the turn of the century, of Heidegger in his Being in Time, 1927, of Gadamer who in many ways uh, can be understood as a disciple and student of Heidegger uh, and, the, and a tradition which persists today um, follows from uh, the initial engagements of Schleiermacher during uh, the Romantic period with literature. All right, so <coughs> what is the basic problematic for hermeneutics in this tradition? It's what we probably all have heard about. Um, and something that I will briefly try to describe, 
what's called the hermeneutic circle. So what is the hermeneutic circle? It's a relationship between a reader and a text, or in the case of certain kinds of students of hermeneutics, but not Gadamer, I think, of a relationship between a reader and an author. In other words, a relationship which is, which, is, which is understood to aim at understanding the intention of an author. The uh, author of the fourth quotation on your sheet for today, E. D. Hirsch, belongs in that tradition, who understands the hermeneutic circle as a relationship between a reader and an author, where the text is a kind of a mediatory document containing the meaning of the author. But for Gadamer and his tradition, it's a little different. It can be understood as the relationship between a reader and a text. And this can be put in a variety of ways. Uh, it's often put in terms of the relationship between the part and the whole. I approach a text, um, and of course, the first thing I read is a phrase or a sentence. There's still a lot more of the text, and so that's, that's a part. But I immediately begin to form an opinion about this heart this part with respect to an imagined or supposed whole. And then, you know, I and I use this sense I have of what the whole must be like to continue to read successive parts, what, what success, successive parts, lines, uh, sentences, whatever they may be. And I keep referring those successive parts back to a sense of the whole which changes as a result of knowing more and more and more parts. And so the circularity of this interpretive engagement has to do with moving back and forth between a certain preconception about the whole that I form from studying a part, moving then to the part, back to the whole, back to the part, back to the whole, and so on in a circular pattern. This can also be understood as a relationship between the present and the past, that is to say, my particular historical horizon uh, and some other historical horizon that I'm trying to come to terms with uh, so that I refer back and forth to, 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 to what I know about the world before I engage the text, uh, what the text seems to, seem, seems to be saying in relation to that which I know, how it might change my sense of what I know, uh, but referring back from what I know uh, continuously to an understanding of the way in which the past text speaks. And finally, of course, because hermeneutics isn't just something that takes place across an historical gulf. It also can take place across a social or cultural gulf, maybe not even very much of a gulf. When we engage each other in conversation, we are still performing a hermeneutic act. I have to try to understand what you're saying, and I have to refer it to what I want to say, and the circuit of communication between us has to stay open as a result of this mutual and developing understanding of what we're talking about. Uh, and it's the same thing, of course, with conversations across cultures. So understand that hermeneutics isn't necessarily about, as, as Gadamer would put it, merging historical horizons. It's also about merging social and cultural and interpersonal horizons, and it, and, and, and it applies to all of those spheres. All right, now the hermeneutic circle then is uh, of this, it sort of involves this reference back and forth between the entities that I've been trying to describe. And let's just quickly, uh, and here we begin to move into the text, let's, let us uh, uh, listen to Gadamer's version of how the circularity of this thinking works on page 722 toward the bottom of the left-hand column. The reader, Gadamer's word is he, <laughs> the reader projects before himself a meaning for the text as a whole as soon as some initial meaning emerges in the text. In other words, as soon as he sees what the part is like, he projects or imagines what the whole must be that contains this part. Again, the latter 
That is to say, it, the, the sense of the initial meaning emerges only because he is reading the text with particular expectations in regard to a certain meaning. The working out of this four project, that is to say, the sense we have in advance of the meaning of what we are going to read, the working out of this four project, which is constantly revised in terms of what emerges as he penetrates into the meaning, is understood as what is there. In other words, God, that, that what is there, which is a kind of way of talking that Gadamer inherits from Heidegger, uh, really has to do with what Gadamer means when he talks also about die Sache, the subject matter. In other words, the effort of a reader in coming to terms with the meaning of a text is an effort to master the subject matter, what is there. Uh, and I suppose it's fair enough to say, uh, in, as a kind of paraphrase, what the text is really about. I mean, that, that, that's what Gadamer means when he says, what is there. Anyway, you can see that in this passage on page 722, Gadamer is describing the circularity of our reading, and he's describing it in a way that may raise certain concerns for us. What do you mean a four structure or a four project or a four having? Can't I view this thing, as we might say, objectively? In other words, aren't I going to be hopelessly prejudiced about what I read if I've got some sort of preliminary conception of what it's all about? Why don't I just set aside my pre preliminary conceptions so that I can understand precisely what is there? How am I ever going to understand what is there if I, approach th if, I, if I approach it with some sort of preliminary idea, which I never really get rid of? I mean, because each revision of what I think is there as a result of further reading is nevertheless becomes in itself yet another four project or preliminary conception. In other words, this way of thinking seems to suggest, to tell you the truth, does suggest that you can't get away from preliminary conceptions about things. And this, of course, is disturbing. And it's, and it's especially disturbing when you then get Heidegger and Gadamer insisting that even though there are always these preliminary conceptions, which Gadamer sort of boldly calls prejudices, and, and we'll come back to that, even though there are always these preliminary conceptions, there nevertheless are, as Heidegger puts it, two ways into the circle. Right? A circle, in other words, is not necessarily a vicious circle. See, that's what you're tempted to conclude if you say, I can never get away from preconceptions. Right? It's just, I'm just going back and forth meaninglessly because I'm never going to get anyplace. Right? Um, but Gadamer and Heidegger say, no, that's not true. That's not true. A circle isn't at all necessarily vicious. The way into the circle can also be constructive. That is to say, you really can get someplace. And so you're entitled to say, well, OK, it, it can be constructive, but how can that be? Take a look at the second passage on your sheet from Heidegger. Not the whole passage, but just the first sentence of it, where Heidegger says, in an interpretation, the way in which the entity we are interpreting is to be conceived can be drawn from the entity itself, or the interpretation can force the entity into concepts to which it is opposed in its manner of being. Now, wait a minute, you say. If I'm just dealing in preconceptions here, how can I take anything from the entity itself? Right? That's just what seems to be uh, at risk. Uh, if I can never get beyond my preconceptions. Well, let me give you an example. I was going to do this later in the lecture, but I feel like doing it now. Um, in, the, in the 18th century, uh, a poet named Mark Akenside wrote a long poem called The Pleasures of the Imagination. And in this poem, there's the line, the great creator raised his plastic arm. Now, let's say that we are, of course, we're into polymers. We know what plastic is. We have no, we have no concern or hesitation in, in, in saying what, what plastic is. 
And so we say, oh, gee, well, I guess the crea great creator has a sort of a prosthetic limb. Um, and, uh, and he raised it. All right, so that's, that's, that's what the, the sentence must mean. Um, but then, of course, if we know something about the horizon within which Akenside was writing his poem, we are aware that in the 18th century the word plastic meant sinuous, powerful, flexible. And in that case, of course, we immediately are able to recognize what Akenside meant. This line makes perfect sense. Great, you know, great creator raised his sinuous, powerful, flexible arm, um, and we know where we stand. Now, notice this. There's th in other words, this is an example of good and bad prejudice. Right? The good prejudice is our prior awareness that plastic meant something different in the 18th century than it means now. And we bring that prejudice to bear on our interpretation of the line. And that is a constructive way into the circle, according to Heidegger and Gadamer. The bad prejudice is when we leap to the conclusion without thinking for a moment that there might be some other historical horizon that we know what plastic means. And the reason we can tell the difference, by the way, is that if we invoke the 18th century meaning of plastic, we immediately see that the line makes perfect sense, that it's perfectly reasonable and, and not even particularly notable. Or, and if we, but if we bring our own meaning to bear, that is to say our own sense of what the word plastic means, then of course the meaning of the line must be crazy. I mean, what on earth, you know? <laughs> you know why, why would he be saying this about the great creator? Now, I think I'll come back to this example next week when we're talking about an essay uh, called The Intentional Fallacy by W.K. Wimsatt, and I will revisit the possibility that there might be some value in supposing that Akenside meant uh, the great creator raised his prosthetic limb. But I'll, leave that, but I'll leave that until next week. I think for the moment it should be plain to you that this is a good example or a good way of understanding what the difference between a useful preconception and a useless preconception brought to bear on an interpretive act might consist in. All right, now in giving the example now, I've gotten a little bit uh, ahead of myself, uh, but so, so let me reprise a bit. As you can tell from your reading of Gadamer, and of course the title of the great book from which this excerpt is taken is Truth and Method, Wahrheit und Methode, with its implicit suggestion that there is a difference between truth and method. Uh, the great objection of Gadamer to other people's way of doing hermeneutics is that they believe that there is a methodology of interpretation. And the basic methodology Gadamer is attacking in the excerpt you've read is what he calls historicism. Now, that's a tricky word for us because later in the semester we're going to be uh, reading about something called the new historicism, and the new historicism actually has nothing to do with what Gadamer is objecting to in this form of historicism. So we will return to the new historicism in that context. But, but for the moment, what Gadamer means by historicism is this. The belief that you can set aside preconceptions. In other words, that you can completely factor out your own subjectivity, your own view of things, your own historically conditioned point of view. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said historically conditioned. Your own point of view. You can completely factor that out in order to enter into the mindset of some other time or place. That you can completely enter into the mind of another. This then is the, ob this is the object of historicizing, um, and as we'll see at the end of the lecture, uh, there's a certain nobility about it to be juxtaposed with the nobility of Gadamerian hermeneutics, but in the meantime, Gadamer is objecting to this because he says you simply can't do this. You cannot factor out these preconceptions. All you can do, he says, is recognize that you do exist, you do live, you do think consciously within a certain horizon. Recognize that you are coming face to face with another horizon, 
and try to bridge your horizon and the other horizon. In other words, to put it simply, to find common ground, to find some way of merging a present with a past, a here with a there, in such a way that results in what Gadamer calls Horizontsverschmelzung, horizon merger. Uh, and, this, and, and this act of horizon merger uh, has as its effect, uh, as its result, what Gadamer calls effective history. And by effective history, he means history which is useful. That is to say, history which really can go to work for us and is not just a matter of accumulating an archive uh, or distancing ourselves from the past. Uh, I'll say again somewhat in advance, perhaps of the time I should say it, that Gadamer thinks that there's something immoral about historicism. Why? Because it condescends toward the past. It supposes that the past is simply a repository of information. And it never supposes for a minute that if we actually merge ourselves with the moment of the past, the past may be able to tell us something we ought to know. That is to say, may be able uh, actually to teach us something. Gadamer believes that historicism forgets the possibility of being taught something by pastness or otherness. Now, I think in order to make this, this viewpoint seem plausible, we probably should study it for a moment a little bit more philosophically. That is to say, uh, you're asking yourself, well, sure, you know what? I can, you know, I, I pride myself on this, I can factor out all forms of subjectivity. I really can be objective. Um, I'm perfectly capable of understanding the past in and for itself without any contribution of my own, without, in short, any preconceptions. So let's look at a couple of passages from your sheet, uh, from Heidegger's Being in Time, from his analytic of the hermeneutic circle, um, and see what Heidegger has to say about this claim. The first passage on your sheet, Heidegger says, when we have to do with anything, the mere seeing of the things which are closest to us bears in itself the structure of interpretation and in so primordial a manner that just to grasp something free, as it were, of the as requires a certain adjustment. What is Heidegger saying? He's saying, I stand here and, I, and I'm just looking. I'm just, I'm, I, I look back there and I ju I'm, I'm just seeing that sign that says exit. I'm not interpreting it. I don't have any preconception about it. I'm just looking. Right? Heidegger says this is a total illusion. How do I know it's a sign? How do I know it says exit? How do, I mean, I, I bring a million preconceptions to bear on what I take to be a simple act of looking. And then Heidegger says, you know what? It's not at all uninteresting to imagine the possibility of just seeing something without seeing it as something. It would be kind of exhilarating, wouldn't it, to be able just to have something before us. Right? But he says, you know what? That is well nigh impossible. It is, in fact, a very, very difficult and derivative act of the mind to try to forget that I'm looking at a sign that says exit, and in fact, just to be looking at what is there without knowing. In, in other words, I don't not know first that that's a sign that says exit. The very first thing I know is that it's a sign that says exit. There's no prior act of consciousness. It's the very first thing that I know. It's an interesting thought experiment to try not to know that that's a sign that says exit. And as Heidegger points out in this passage, that's a thought experiment which, if it can be done at all, derives from that prior knowledge. I always know something first as something. If I can just have it there before me, that is a very difficult and derivative 
intellectual act, and it cannot be understood as primordial or primitive. You know, I am always already in possession of an interpretation of whatever object I look at, which isn't at all to say that my interpretation is correct. It's only to say that I can't escape the fact that the very first movement of mind, not the last movement, but the first movement of mind is interpretive. Right? We always see something as something, and that is precisely the act of interpretation. We can never just have it there before us, or as I say, if we can, if we can, it's a very, very difficult act. Continue the passage. This grasping, which, as, which is free of the as, is a privation of the kind of seeing, and you see how attracted Heidegger is to it because he shifts his rhetoric, is a privation of the kind of seeing in which one merely understands. In other words, it would be an extraordinary thing not to understand, Heidegger is saying. We can't help understanding. We always already understand, which has nothing to do, again, with whether or not we're right or wrong. We always already just necessarily do understand. It's a kind of imprisonment understanding. And, he and when Heidegger says, wouldn't it be great not to have to merely understand, right? He's saying, wouldn't it be great just to have it there before us? But he's also insisting that this is an incredibly difficult, if not impossible, moment of thought. All right. so. <coughs> That's why, and this is, this is perhaps the essential, the central passage, and, you, and I don't want to pause over it, but you can look at passage number three on your sheet, which says roughly again what Heidegger is saying in the first passage. That's why uh, we must work always as interpreters with preconceptions, with fore understandings. Now, what about this word prejudice? It is a sort of a problematic word. Uh, Gadamer is a bit apologetic about it, and he goes into the appropriate etymologies. You know, uh, the French préjugé, the German for urteil, all mean prejudgment, uh, a prior judgment, uh, and they actually can be used in a court of law as a stage toward arriving at a verdict. Um, they needn't be accompanied by popular prejudice. Against prejudice, as Gadamer says, this is the characteristic. Uh, this is the characteristic idea of the Enlightenment. It's prejudice against prejudice that we can be objective, that we can free ourselves of prejudice. Okay, fine, but uh, you know, prejudice is bad. You know, we have a we we have a right to. to I mean, we know prejudice is bad. We know uh, we know what prejudice has wrought historically and socially. So how, so how can we try to vindicate it in this way? It's, it's extremely problematic. What Gadamer does in his essay is actually uh, an act of intellectual conservatism. It has to be admitted. That whole section of the essay in which he talks about classicism, and you may have said to yourself as you were reading it, well, gee, isn't this sort of digressive? What's he, what's he so interested in classicism for? The whole section of the essay in which he's talking about classicism and which he, which he later calls tradition is meant to suggest that we really can't merge horizons effectively unless we have a very broad and extensive common ground with what we're reading. And the great thing about classicism for Gadamer, or what he calls tradition, <coughs> is that it's something we can share. The classical, Gadamer argues, is that which doesn't just speak to its own historical moment but speaks for all time speaks to all of us in different ways, but does speak to us. That is to say, does proffer its claim to speak true. The classical can do that. Okay, great, we say to Gadamer. That's a, a, and, and, and certainly you're, you're entitled to an intellectually conservative canon. Maybe other principles of hermeneutics will place much more stress on innovation or novelty or difference. But you know, you're a little, you, you're not sure people can understand unless they share a great deal of common ground. All well and good. But you know what? That's where the bad side of prejudice sneaks in. You know, slavery um, was considered perfectly appropriate and natural to, the, to a great many 
of the most exalted figures working within the tradition that Gadamer rightly calls classical. Classical antiquity, uh, a great many modern figures never stopped to question slavery. Slavery was, a, was an aspect of classical culture which had its defenses. Well, Gadamer doesn't talk about this, obviously, but it is an aspect of that prejudice that one might share with tradition if one were somewhat more critical than this gesture of sharing might indicate. I just say that in passing, uh, uh, calling your attention to it as a risk uh, that's involved in our engagement um, with a hermeneutic project uh, of the nature of Gadamer's. Uh, and it's, and which, uh, it's not to say that Gadamer favored slavery or, or anything of the sort. Uh, it is, however, to say that prejudice, while plainly we can um, understand it simply to mean preconception which is inescapable and understand that philosophically, nevertheless can still be bad and we have to, and, 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 and we have to understand uh, the way in which it's something that if we're going to accept this point of view, we need to live with. All right, now, so it is troublesome. It is troublesome. And it's, 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 it's troublesome uh, also perhaps uh, in a variety of other ways that I won't go into. I think that what I'd like to do in the time remaining is to call your attention to two passages, one in Gadamer's text, which I'm about to read, and the other, the fourth passage on your sheet by, a, uh, by someone called E.D. Hirsch, whom you may actually know as the author of uh, a dictionary of what every school child should know uh, and, as a, and, and as a sort of a champion of the intellectual right during the whole period when uh, literary theory flourished, but a person who also is seriously invested in hermeneutics uh, and, and conducted a lifelong feud with Gadamer uh, about the principles of hermeneutics. And the two passages that I'm about to read um, juxtapose the viewpoints that I've been trying to evoke uh, in describing Gadamer's position. The dignity and nobility of Gadamer is that it involves being interested in, what it, it, in something true. That is to say, in hoping that there is an intimate relationship between meaning, arriving at meaning, and arriving at something that speaks to us as true. Hirsch, on the other hand, is invoking a completely different kind of dignity. And what I want you to realize as we juxtapose these two passages is that it is impossible to reconcile them. Uh, and it poses for us uh, a choice which, as people interested in interpretation, uh, needs ultimately to be made and suggests perhaps differing forms of commitment. Now, the first uh, passage is in Gadamer's text on page 735, very bottom of the page, and then I'll be going over to page 736. Gadamer says, and here again he's attacking historicism. The text that is understood historically is forced to abandon its claim that it is uttering something true. We think we understand when we see the past from a historical standpoint, i.e., place ourselves in the historical situation and seek to reconstruct the historical horizon. I've been attempting to summarize this position, and so I trust that I, I, I trust that it's easily intelligible uh, as as I read it to you now. In fact, however, we have given up the claim to find in the past any truth valid and intelligible for ourselves. And by the way, this would also apply to cultural conversation. You know, I mean, if I'm proud of knowing that in another culture. If I belch after dinner, it's a compliment to the cook, right? And if I'm proud of knowing that without, you know, with, without drawing any conclusions from it, that's sort of the equivalent of historicism. It's just a factoid for me. In other words, it's not, you know, it's not, it, it's, it's not an effort to come to terms with anything. It's not, it's not an, e an effort to engage in dialogue. It's just historicizing 
otherness in a way that somehow or another satisfies my quest for information. That's what, so, so it's not just a question of the past, as I say, and as I've said before, it's a question of cultural conversation uh, as well. Uh, thus, this acknowledgment of the otherness of the other, which makes him the object of objective knowledge, involves the fundamental suspension of his claim to truth. Devastating. I think a brilliant argument and I think ought to remind us wh of what's at stake when we invoke the notion of objectivity. Implicit, according to Gadamer, in the notion of objectivity is an abandonment of the possibility of learning from the object, of learning from otherness. It only becomes a question of knowing the object, of knowing it in and for itself, in its own terms, and not at all necessarily of learning from it, of being spoken to by it. All right, but now listen to Hirsch. All right, this is, <laughs> you know, I mean, it, this is really, this is really a hard choice to make. <laughs> what Hirsch says, invoking Kant, rightly invoking Kant, he says, Kant held it to be a foundation of moral action that men should be conceived as ends in themselves, not as instruments of other men. In other words, you are an end and not a means to me unless, in fact, I'm exploiting you and instrumentalizing you. Right? That's Kant's position, and that's what Hirsch is leaping to defend. You know, this idea, you know, that it that I don't really care or that I don't really think I can come to terms with the actual sort of with the, with, with the actual meaning of an entity as that entity is instrumentalizing the entity. In other words, it's do it's it, it's approaching it for me. This 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 turns the whole idea of being open to the possibility that the other is speaking through. <coughs> Excuse me. It turns that on its ear and says, "Oh no, no! You're just appropriating the other for yourself, right? You're instrumentalizing the other. You're not taking it seriously as itself." That's what that's that that's Hirsch's response, and he continues. <coughs> this imperative is transferable to the words of men, because speech is an extension and expression of men in the social domain, and also because when we fail to conjoin a man's intention to his words, we lose the soul of speech, which is to convey meaning and to understand what is intended to be conveyed. Notice that although the nobility of this alongside the nobility of Gadamer is obvious and painful <laughs> and really does seem to, to, to bring us to a crossroads you know, where we really want to be Yogi Berra, Right and go in both directions, you know. Even though this is the case, notice one thing: Hirsch is not saying anything about truth. Right? He's talking about meaning. That's good, and he's and he and he's making the notion of arriving at a correct meaning as honorific as he possibly can. But it is significant that he's not talking about truth. It's Gadamer who's talking about truth. For Hirsch, the important thing is the meaning. For Gadamer, the important thing is that the meaning be true, right? And that's and, and, and that's where the that's where the distinction essentially lies. Gadamer is willing to sacrifice because of his belief in the in, in, in the inescapability of preconception. He's willing to sacrifice historical or cultural exactitude of meaning. He's willing to acknowledge that there's always something of me in my interpretation. But it's a good something because, after all, I am mindful of, th of the horizon of otherness. I'm not just saying plastic means polymer, right? But nevertheless, there's something of me in the interpretation. Hirsch is saying there's nothing of me in the interpretation. Therefore, I am able to arrive accurately and objectively at the meaning of the other, and I honor the other by arriving with such accuracy at the meaning, but notice that truth is bracketed out. I mean, it's not, it, it doesn't seem to be a question for Hirsch of whether the other speaks truth. This is unfair to Hirsch, by the way, because it actually is. All you, do, all you need to do is read him, and you will recognize that it does matter to Hirsch whether the other speaks truth, 
But it's not implicit in the philosophical position he's taking up here. It's something that the philosophical position sacrifices. Okay, so that's the basic distinction. And as I say, as far as I can see, it's irreconcilable. You know? So it, you know, it leaves us with a choice that really does have to be made. And it's a choice which looms over a course in literary theory and coming to understand the tradition of literary theory. Some will take one side, others will take another, and we'll find ourselves uh, siding or not siding with them, at least in part, for reasons that arise out of the distinction between these two positions that I've been making today. Okay, so we may or may not have the lecture on either, but on Tuesday we'll be getting into the varieties of formalism, and first we'll take up the American New Criticism. All right, thanks. So uh, before we go on to talk uh, a little bit about the American historicist, uh, hermeneutical scholar E. D. Hirsch, and Wolfgang Ezer, uh, for whom you have your reading assignment, uh, I want to go back to Gadamer a little bit and say something more about his taste, that is to say, the kind of literary and intellectual canon that his approach to hermeneutics establishes. You remember, Gadamer is very much concerned with the norm of classicism, which later in his essay he's inclined to call tradition instead. Uh, and the reason that that's so important to him is that he actually has a very conservative view of what the reader can accomplish in understanding another horizon. Gadamer, in other words, does think that the reader can perform any great miracles in intuitively feeling his or her way into the mind of another time and place. So that the value of classicism and of tradition for Gadamer is that there is evident common ground in certain texts. Sometimes we refer to them as great books. In other words, the sort of text that speaks or we feel as though it's speaking uh, to all places and times. Uh, of course, it's contested whether or not there's really any, any merit in talking about texts that way, but Gadamer's view is very strongly that this conservatism about the canon, which is re intimately related to his conservatism, his doubt about the actual capability of a reader to span enormous gaps, and I use that word advisedly because it is the word that Ezer uses uh, to talk about the distance between the reader and the text and the way in which that, and the way in which that distance should be negotiated. So in any case, um, this conservatism, it seems to me, however, can be questioned. And I thought that we'd begin then by turning to page 731, uh, the left-hand column, the footnote. Uh, you're beginning to realize, I'm sure, that I like footnotes. Uh, Gibbon, of course, was said to have lived his life in his footnotes. Um, perhaps I live the, my life in the footnotes of other people. In any case, in this footnote, Gadamer says something. I, I, I think it's very rare that we can actually just sort of outright disagree with Gadamer, but he says something in this footnote that I believe we can actually disagree with. Toward the bottom of the footnote, 731, left-hand column, he says, just as in conversation we understand irony to the extent to which we are in agreement on the subject with the other person. We understand irony only, he means, to the extent to which we are in agreement with the other person. If you are expressing an opinion and otherwise which differs radically from my own, I can't understand, according to Gadamer, whether or not you're being ironic. This seems to me to be just patently false. Uh, think about politics. Think about political talk shows. Think about political campaigns. When our political opponent is being ironic about our views, we understand the irony perfectly well. We're used to it, uh, we've accommodated ourselves to it, and of course it's the same in reverse. Our opponent understands our ironies. And there is, it seems to me, a perfect uh, 
kind of symbiosis, ironically enough, um, between political opponents precisely maybe in the measure to which their ironies are mutually intelligible. It probably teaches each of them a good deal uh, to accommodate, to encounter, to get used to the ironies of the other. And I think this applies to conversation in general. It's very easy to pick up most forms of irony. We don't, have, we don't have an enormous difficulty grasping them, and it doesn't seem to me that our capability of grasping irony is founded on a necessary underlying agreement. That's what he's saying. Now, if this is the case, it seems to me that one has found a loophole in Gadamer's conservatism about what the reader can do. His premise is that in order to understand, there has to be a basis of agreement. But if what we've just said about understanding each other's ironies, even where there is pretty wholesale disagreement, is true, that ought to apply also to our capacity to read work that with which we distinctly disagree, with which we feel we can never come to terms uh, in terms of affirming its value, but which we nevertheless can understand. If understanding is not predicated on agreement, the possibility of opening up the canon, as we say, insisting that it doesn't have to be an absolutely continuous traditional canon, is available to us once again. And Gadamer's conservatism on this issue can be questioned. Now, it's not that Gadamer's insisting on absolute continuity. On the contrary, you'll probably remember that on page 732, um, it, the, the, uh, um, the, it can't be 732, so please disregard that. I'm not going to read this passage anyway. Uh, uh, he says early in the essay that in order to recognize that we are in the presence of something that isn't merely within our own historical horizon, we need to be pulled up short. In other words, to go back to that example, once more, the, um, we need to recognize that there's something weird about that word plastic. Um, and in being pulled up short, we recognize the need also for the fundamental act of reading in Gadamer, which is the merger of horizons. We, th in other words, that we are dealing knowingly with a horizon not altogether our own that has to be negotiated, that has to be merged with our own for understanding to be possible. So, Gadamer, in fact, Gadamer even insists that if we don't have this phenomenon of being pulled up short, our reading is basically just solipsistic. We, we just take it for granted that what we're reading is completely within our own horizon um, and we don't make any effort at all to understand that which is fundamentally or at least in some ways different. Gadamer acknowledges this, even insists on it, as I say, but he doesn't lay stress on it because the gap that is implied in the need to be pulled up short is not a big one. That is to say, it's one that we can easily satisfy. Plastic, again. Oh, gee, that's a strange word we say, so we go to the OED, we see it meant something different, then our problem is solved and we continue. No big deal, right? But there may be uh, ways of being pulled up short, occasions for being pulled up short, that Gadamer thinks exceed the imaginative grasp of a reader. And this, as you'll see when we return to Ezer, after I've said a few things about Hirsch, this, as you'll see, is the fundamental difference between Gadamer and Ezer, where, Ga where for Gadamer the gap between reader and text, between my horizon and the horizon of the text, is, is perforce a small one. For Ezer, it needs to be a much larger one in order for what he calls the act of the reader, the reading act, really to swing into high gear. And we'll see that this has implications for the obvious difference between their two canons. All right, but now I want to say something about the person who, the passage of whom uh, I quoted 
over against the passage from Gadamer at the end of the Gadamer lecture. You remember Gadamer said um, we have to be open to the otherness of the past uh, in, and in order that for us it may speak true. But if we simply bracket out our own feelings, uh, that can't possibly happen. So that we have to recognize that in this mutuality of the reading experience, we really are in a conversation. We're open to being told something true by someone else. Hirsch, on the other hand, says, oh, well, you know, the important thing is to know the exact meaning of that other person because that's the only way to honor the otherness of the person. You know, Kant says people ought to be uh, an end and not a means for us. We ought to understand them on their terms. Gadamer's claim, however, was that if we do that, we are in fact suspending the way in which it ma- might be that they speak true. We're, si- we're honoring instead the integrity of what we're saying without thinking about whether or not it might be true. So I introduced Hirsch in that context, and now I want to go back to him a little bit, uh, and I want to work with two passages which I've sent you all uh, in email form, and which I've neglected to put on the board, but they're so, so short I don't think that will be necessary. The first of the two passages I want to talk about is Hirsch's argument that consciousness is an aff- th- that meaning is an affair of consciousness and not of words. Meaning is an affair of consciousness and not of words. In other words, the text is what makes the ascertainment of meaning possible and available to us, but meaning is not in the text. Meaning is in the intention of the author. And that, is the, and that is what we need to arrive at as we work through the text. Meaning is an affair of consciousness and not of words. Now think about this. What it means is that in understanding a text, we are attempting to grasp it in paraphrase. We are, in other words, attempting to grasp it in a sentence that might read something like, what the author means to say is. Right? That is in, in, so, that it, so that it's not what the text means, which might be anything, according to Hirsch, if you just appeal to the text. It's what the author means to say is. Okay, so what's implied here? On the one hand, you can say this is just absolute total nonsense. We use a text to find meaning in something that we don't have available to us. Why don't we just find meaning in the text which is available to us? Uh, That would make more sense. It's up to us to construe the text. Um, We can't possibly know what the author meant except on the basis of our determination of the meaning of the text, so why not just focus our attention to meaning on the text? Hirsch was a student of Wimsatt. Hirsch was engaged in lifelong disagreement with Gadamer, but he was a student of Wimsatt, Wimsatt, the author of The Intentional Fallacy. Obviously, Hirsch was a rebellious student (laughs) and insisted that far from uh, wanting to take Wimsatt's position, appealing to intention was the most important thing you can do, the only thing you can do which establishes, according to the title of his first important book on hermeneutics, validity in interpretation. All right. Now, it seems it's, it's very difficult. It's very difficult intuitively to assent to Hirsch's position. And I'll just tell you, by the way, that I don't. I can't. Uh, but I will say in passing, in defense of Hirsch, that if we reflect on the matter, we realize that in common sense terms, appealing to an author's intention is precisely what we do for practical reasons. Let me give you an example. You're all students. You are sitting in classrooms that in many cases oblige you to take exams. Your instructor tells you, when you write your exam, don't just parrot the words of the authors you're studying. I want to, I want to know that you understand those authors. Think about it. You prove to your teacher that you understand the authors by being able to put their meaning in other words. 
In other words, to say the author is intending to say something, not just that the text says something and this is what it says at, with your exam then, you know, one long screed of quotations. Ironically, the, ex the, the, the instructor doesn't really want just quotation on an exam. He wants explanation and the form of explanation is paraphrase. You can't have paraphrase unless you can identify a meaning which is interpersonal, a meaning which can be shared among a group that understands and can be expressed in other words. That's the key. If you can put it in other words, those other words take the form of an appeal to intention. All right, so that's and, and, and that's an important point argument in Hirsch's favor. We realize that practically speaking, the necessity of appealing to paraphrase in order to guarantee mutual understanding certainly does seem to be something like agreeing or admitting that meaning is an affair of consciousness, not of words. My consciousness, the author's consciousness, the consciousness that we can all share, that's where we find meaning and meaning takes the form of that kind of paraphrase that everyone can agree on. All right, so much then uh, to, the, uh, to, the, to, to the advantage or benefit of Hirsch. Uh, there are lots of things to be said against it on the other hand, which I don't want to pause over now because I think a, a course of lectures in literary theory will inevitably show the ways uh, in which paraphrase is uh, inadequate to the task of rigorous interpretation. Cleanth Brooks, uh, the new critic, uh, uh, writes a famous essay called The Heresy of Paraphrase, insisting that uh, proper literary interpretation is a wooden, mechanical, inflexible exercise if it reduces the incredible complexity of a textual surface to paraphrase. Um, and so it's a complex issue uh, and I should, I should leave it having said this much, leave it ex at least for the moment. Now one other thing that Hirsch says, the other thing that I, uh, that I quoted um, is in effect, I'll paraphrase now, <laughs> that, uh, that, uh, that what Gadamer omits to realize is that there is a difference between the meaning of a text and the significance of a text. That is Hirsch's other key position. And we can understand it by saying something like this. The meaning of a text is what the author intended it to mean. That is to say, what we can establish with a reliable paraphrase. The significance of the text, which Hirsch does not deny interest to, the significance of the text is the meaning for us. That is to say, what we take to be important about this meaning. Uh, the way in which, for example, we can translate it into our own terms historically, we can adapt it to a cause or, a, or an intellectual position, the ways, in other words, in which we can take the meaning of a text and make it significant for us. The difference between meaning and significance then is something that Hirsch takes very seriously and he insists, and here's of course where it becomes controversial, he insists that it's possible to tell the difference between meaning and significance. If good historicist that you are, you can pin down accurately and incontestably the author's meaning, appealing to all the philological tricks that you have, uh, throwing out irrelevancies and insisting that you finally have the meaning right. And of course, how many times has that happened, which is obviously one point of disagreement with Hirsch and insisting that you finally have the meaning right, then once you've done that, once you've secured the integrity and accuracy of the meaning, Hirsch says, yeah, okay, fine, now you can do anything you like with the text. You, know, you can adapt it for any, any sort of possible purpose. But the crucial thing is to keep the distinction between meaning and significance clear. Obviously, Gadamer, Refuses, that we re refuses to argue that we can distinguish in that way reliably. We don't know because it's a question of merging horizons, my horizon and the horizon of the text. We don't know 
with any guarantee where meaning leaves off and significance begins, so that the splitting apart of the two terms is something that simply can't be accomplished by the way in which we enter the hermeneutic circle. That's Gadamer's position, uh, and it is the position of anyone who supposes that uh, Hirsch, uh, although the, once again, although the distinction, what he means by the distinction is clear enough. Yes, yes, you say, I see exactly what he means. Nevertheless, the, to secure the distinction is the in, in, in actual practice, say, okay, this is the meaning and now this is how I'm going to make it significant. Well, you know, it seems Im uh, unlikely indeed that this is something anyone could ever <coughs> accomplish. All right, finally, to turn to Wolfgang Eser. Eser is concerned with what he calls the act of the reader, das Akt des Lesers, uh, is the title of one of his books, and he is, and, and in so doing, he establishes himself as a person very much in the tradition of phenomenology, deriving from Husserl, more directly in Eser's case, from a, an analyst of the way in which the reader moves from sentence to sentence in negotiating a text. Uh, a Polish intellectual named Roman Ingarden, who is quoted frequently in the essay that you have. Um, those are the primary influences on Ezer, but he himself has been tremendously influential in turn. Readers' interest in the reader, <laughs> Ezer's interest in the reader's experience uh, is part of a school of thought that he helped to found that grew up around the University of Konstanz in the 60s and 70s, uh, which resulted in a series of seminars on what was called reception history or alternatively the aesthetics of reception. And Ezer's colleague was Hans Robert Jaus, whom we will be reading later in the course. Uh, the influence of the so-called Konstanz School spread to the United States uh, and had many ramifications here, uh, particularly uh, and crucially in the early work of another critic we'll be turning to later in the semester, Stanley Fish. Uh, so reception history has been a kind of partly theoretical, partly scholarly field, uh, one that's really still flourishing ever since the early work in the great Konstanz seminars of Ezer, uh, Jaus, and others. So, and Ezer later in his career, he died just a couple of years ago, later in his career taught annually at uh, University of California, Irvine. And by that time, he was very much engaged in a new aspect of his project, uh, which he called the anthropology of fiction. That is to say, why do we have fiction? Why do we tell stories to each other? All of Ezer's work is grounded in the notion of literature as fiction. He's almost exclusively a scholar of the novel, and by the way, one of the first obvious differences uh, you can notice between Ezer and Gadamer is that whereas Gadamer is an intellectual historian whose canonical texts are works of philosophy, uh, works of social thought, uh, as well as great works of literature. Uh, for Ezer, it's a completely different canon. He is exclusively concerned with fiction and how we read fiction and how we come to understand fiction and how we determine the meaning of a work of fiction. And as I say, in the, in the last phase of his career, when he started thinking about the anthropology of fiction, um, he raised the even more fundamental question, I think a very important one, though not necessarily to be aimed exclusively at fiction, uh, the anthropological question, why we have fiction at all, why it has been a persisting trans-historical phenomenon of human culture that we tell stories to each other, that we make things up, uh, when, after all, when after all we could be spending all of our time well, just talking about things that actually are around us. How is it that we feel the need to make things up? All right, now, as you read Ezer, you'll see immediately that he, in tone and in, and, and in his sense of what's important and his understanding of the way in which we negotiate the world of texts, that he much more closely resembles Gadamer than Hirsch. 
we can say this um, in two different ways. We can say that Ezer's position is a way, is a, is, is a reconstruction of what Gadamer says has essentially to say about the merger of horizons. For example, on page 1002, uh, the bottom of the left hand column, over to the right hand column, he says the convergence of text and reader, the convergence of text and reader, Gadamer's way of putting that would be the merger of the uh, reader's horizon, my horizon, with the horizon within which the text appears. Ezer says, the convergence of text and reader brings the literary work into existence. This is implied in Gadamer as well. It's not your horizon, it's not my horizon, it's that effective history which takes place when our horizons merge. That is the locus of meaning for Gadamer. By the same token, for what, what, what Ezer is saying is that the space of meaning is virtual and this is the word he uses. It's neither in the text nor in the reader, but the result of the negotiation back and forth between the text and the reader. He says, so it brings the literary work into existence in a virtual space. And this convergence can never be precisely pinpointed, but must always remain virtual and is not to be identified either with the reality of the text or with the individual disposition of the reader. So you see, this is God and Miriam. This is the result, this is the fruit of the hermeneutic engagement between horizons that results in meaning. It's put in a different way by Ezer, but it is uh, in a large degree the same idea. He also plainly shares with Gadamer the assumption, the supposition, that the construal of meaning cannot be altogether objective. In other words, Ezer is no more uh, an historicist than Gadamer is, but insists rather on this mutual exchange of prejudice between the two horizons in question. So he argues on page 1005, the right hand column, one text, this is halfway down the column, one text is potentially capable of several different realizations and no reading can ever exhaust the full potential for each individual reader will fill in the gaps in his own way. And this, of course, brings us to the issue of gaps and the role that they play uh, in the act of reading as Ezer understands it. A gap, it's an interesting term. I don't know, I don't actually know whether e Ezer, to, to be Hirschian, means <laughs> uh, what I'm about to say about gaps. But, but plainly a gap is an abyss, it's a distance between two points. But what's really interesting is that we think of spark plugs, we think of gapping a spark plug. In other words, I don't know if you know how a spark plug works, but, it, but, but, but for the electrical current to fly into operation in a spark plug, the two points of contact have to be gapped, they have to be forced apart to a certain degree. Too much, there's no spark. Too little, there's no too too little. You short out, right? There's no spark. So you have to gap a spark plug. And it seems to me that the aha effect of reading, the movement back and forth across the gap between the reader uh, and the text, can be understood in terms of a spark, right? As though the relationship between the reader and the text were the relationship between the two points uh, of a spark plug. Um, whether Gadamer means that when he speaks of gap or whether he simply means an abyss or distance to be crossed, <laughs> I couldn't say. Um, but I think it's useful, uh, you know, like the opportunities in the word plastic, I think it's useful uh, to suggest that this sense of gapping a spark plug may have some relevance to our understanding of what goes on in this, in this reading process. Now. <coughs> How then does he differ from Gadamer? One way that is, I think, not terribly important, but I think is interesting in view of what we've just been saying about Hirsch, and another way that's absolutely crucial that we've implied already and to which we need to return. <coughs> 
the way that's perhaps not terribly important, at least for president, present purposes, although this is a distinction that's going to be coming up again and again later in the semester, is the way in which he actually seems to distinguish. This is page uh, 1006 uh, in the uh, – how can it be? I've got it uh, – in the um, uh, yeah, in the uh, upper left-hand column. The way in which he appears to distinguish between reading and interpretation, very top of the left-hand column. He says, the text refers back directly to our own preconceptions – Gadamer would call those prejudices – to our own preconceptions, which are revealed by the act of interpretation that is a basic element of the reading process. So there's a wedge there between the concept of reading and the concept of interpretation. I would suggest that it's not unlike the wedge that Hirsch drives between the concept of meaning and the concept of, inter of, of significance. In other words, meaning is construal. Significance is the application of that construal to something. I think that the distinction Ease is making between reading and interpretation can be understood in much the same way. Ezer doesn't make much of the distinction. In other words, it's not an important part of his object uh, of his argument, which is why I say that the difference with Gadamer, who never makes the distinction between reading and interpretation, uh, the difference with Gadamer in this matter 